All right, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the fourth seminar in the Water in the Native World webinar series. My name is Carletta Chief. I'm an associate professor and extension specialist in environmental science at the University of Arizona. As an extension specialist, I work to bring relevant science to Native American communities in a culturally sensitive manner by providing hydrology expertise, transferring knowledge, assessing information needs, and developing applied science projects. This webinar series features papers in a special issue that I was the guest editor for, which was called Water in the Native World. Papers are about water challenges facing tribes where indigenous scientists, community members, and indigenous students are involved in addressing the challenges. You can download the papers at ucower.org. This work was supported by three federal grants. The first grant is the National Science Foundation Award called Water in the Native World, a symposium on indigenous water knowledge and hydrologic sciences, where I actually met several of the authors uh, on many of the papers. The second grant is the USDA uh, NIFA, Water for Agricultural Challenge grant, which is um, called Enhancing Climate Resiliency and Agriculture on American Indian Land. The third grant is uh, the U of A NIEHS Superfund Research Program, which I'm the um, lead on the Community Engagement Corps entitled Risk and Remediation of Metal Mining Waste. Today's seminar is Walla I Agawa Spearing in the Portage Waterway, Michigan. Integrating mixed methodology for insight on a port in tribal fishery, which will be presented by Dr. Andrew Kozic. I encourage you to join our, our next webinar, which will be next Wednesday, entitled Change Rippling Through Our Waters and Culture by Christine Martin and others. We will also be having another uh, webinar so our flyer will be updated featuring our last paper by Dr. Atakue Conroy Ben from Arizona State University. In this paper, Kazich et al. Uh, focus on integrating science with tribal perspectives to re recommend ways to improve the management of tribal fisheries in Michigan. For many tribes, rights to hunting and fishing is protected through Indian treaties. However, different factors may impact the ability of tribes to protect their hunting and fishing rights, such as climate change, pollution, drought, or off-reservation water use. In this paper, Kozic and others combined water temperature measurements made in the Portage Waterway in Michigan during the walleye harvest using a survey administered to the Kewanaw Bay Indian Community, or KIBC, to recommend changes in fishery management for priority zones. I'd like to introduce the speaker for this seminar, Andrew Kozic. Andrew is an environmental science department chair at Kewanaw Bay Ojibwa Community College, or KBOCC in Northern Michigan. He has a bachelor's in research ecology and a master's in environmental policy. His dissertation focused on using mixed methods to compare native and non-native perspectives in climate change and water in the greater Great Lakes area. He also has an associate's degree in Anishinaabe studies from KBOCC. He was recognized as KBOCC's Faculty Member of the Year in 2012 and 2018. However, his greatest pride comes from his accomplishments at the Tribal College, including 100% job placement of graduates, mentoring over 30 students in their internships, guiding 20 student presentations at national conferences, engaging six of his students as co-authors in his papers, and then overseeing a significant increase in his program's enrollment 
since 2011. He also developed a new program at his tribal college in sustainability. So beyond the classroom, um, Dr. Kozic's greatest joy is also um, working with underrepresented students in community-based research that provides important and valuable outcomes for the tribe and then also meaningful experience for his students. His presentation today reflects those three objectives. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kozic. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, being part of this um, presentation today and, um, and for this whole series. And I um, especially want to be sure to thank you, Carletta, for everything you've done putting together the issue and, and making it possible for us to find other ways to get together um, in, in lieu of everything going on in the world. Um, but I also wanted to be sure to uh, let everyone know that I appreciate how you've been a mentor for me for the last few years as I've gone down my own uh, life journey in academia and especially on topics related to the, uh, the human water nexus, which is uh, possibly the, uh, the, the issue of our times and going forward. So, um, so I feel like I should take just a second to expand on your introduction just to um, elaborate on my positionality here with, uh, with uh, my role for the college and um, in the tribe in this research. I just want to be clear that um, I'm not a member of the tribe or a descendant. Um, my family roots in this very area, though, go back uh, into the 1800s, this is where my mom and her family uh, is from, and uh, I've been at the college now for, um, for about 10 years. So um, it's home, and I love it, and um, I certainly love everything I do for, um, for my job here at the college. So I want to also acknowledge that this, um, this paper and this entire project um, is really a, a major team effort. I'm just one uh, member of the team as the PI, and I get to be the guy that writes the uh, grant proposals and the reports and oversees payroll and stuff like that. And every now and then, if I'm lucky, um, they let me strap on my waders and actually go out and do some fun work in the water. But um, the, the other co-authors on the paper all made major um, contributions. Um, Valerie is an important partner, um, and I want to acknowledge that she helped with most of the writing related to her area of expertise involving um, uh, issues related to history, um, governance, treaties, um, environmental justice. That, that's her area of um, expertise. Uh, Jean Mensch is our tribal um, fisheries biologist who's also an adjunct instructor here. So all of the, the field work, the, the, um, the ecological work and a lot of uh, overseeing the student field activities was guided by Jean. And um, Sophia and Nick were our two main student research assistants during um, this period um, that the paper includes. And uh, Sophia, you'll hear me mention her name quite a bit because she did a really wonderful um, capstone independent research project um, based on this. So this served as a, a really helpful foundation for her, um, for her work. And she um, graduated a couple months ago and is in the process of transferring to a four-year program. So that is the research team. And I know they're probably people from across the country, so I better give a brief overview of our study area. Um, simple Google map image here. Hopefully everyone would recognize this is the Great Lakes region, and I superimposed on here the, uh, the Upper Peninsula, because a lot of people recognize the, 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 the mitt that the Lower Peninsula looks like, but we also have this Upper Peninsula, um, or as we call it, the UP. So this is, um, this is our part of Michigan, and we are actually located right on the south shore of Lake Superior. So um, is, if, is if you can probably tell by the coloring on this satellite view, the darker green, um, this, is, this is Northwoods country. So this is not um, farm country or plains. 
Um, we tend to have pretty long winters, um, pretty short growing season. So as you look around um, the world, um, in our little part of the world, you see a lot of forests and a lot of water. Um, very similar to what you'd see in uh, northern Wisconsin or northern Minnesota, if you're familiar with that area. And as for our college, um, Keweenaw Bay Ojibwe Community College, um, we've been around a while and we're fully accredited, but um, we're, we're one of the smaller tribal colleges for sure. We're pretty tiny, actually. We typically have about 100 students um, spread across five associate degree programs. Um, my enrollment tends to hover between 20 and 25 environmental science majors. And for those of you from bigger institutions, um, we, uh, at like most tribal colleges, but not all, but most, um, historically our focus has been on teaching not research. So um, in the 10 years that I've been here, this is something I've been trying to um, positively change in, in my environmental science program, bringing in the, um, the external funding that really makes um, research work and can help with some of the things Carlotta mentioned, like um, the student internships and the purchasing of uh, necessary equipment. But make no uh, mistake about it, we're, we're pretty small. And as I've really tried to ramp up the research here, um, I really try to focus all of my efforts on um, community-based research. So in other words, if I'm employed by the college and I work for the tribe, uh, my obligations to me are to, uh, to serve the community and to contribute as the scientist of the college to um, learning as much as we can about um, possible issues across the community. So this is just a little, uh, little bit of a checklist that I always keep in the back of my mind about things that, um, that my research projects should, should do. And it all comes down to community engagement. Um, I, Work, working with uh, other community members, people across other tribal departments, conducting a lot of surveys to um, identify needs, uh, making sure that uh, anything I do is respectful of and incorporates um, the community values. Um, a lot of collaboration. We're a really rural area. We have two small towns um, that are within our reservation boundaries. So, um, what I like to call assembling the think tank, getting the necessary um, partners on board is really an, impor an important step. And being sure to identify um, the, the benefits to the community, which usually takes the form of uh, some kind of a, a management or recommendation report, working closely with the leaders, um, obviously having all of the necessary um, permissions and approvals, which means, uh, having the support of the tribal council and the college IRB. We, we do have an IRB. Um, and providing some valuable um, outreach or education or free services. As an example, I know there's, um, I was, I've been excited to see the recent presentations involving um, groundwater arsenic um, that um, some of the other authors in this issue are conducting. And that's, my other current project involves groundwater arsenic. So as an example of um, what I'm providing to the community, there is a free testing service, free education, information. And uh, so to me, these are all examples of what good community-based research should really involve. Um, but beyond that, uh, as far as the business at the college goes, curriculum enhancement is always important and, um, and definitely student engagement. Um, through paid internships. So we only have two-year programs here, so I really value the opportunities to get students involved in research, getting them on the ground, um, involved in data collection, um, getting them to conferences to, uh, to co-author um, presentations. Um, so I've got a few, few pictures here of uh, recent that I've taken recently of students, but also just to get them involved in 
uh, community outreach in general. So I have some pictures on the screen here. Uh, let's see, from our, we have an annual kids fishing derby, um, an environmental science fair that, um, that I always get my students involved in. Um, the picture on the bottom left is one of my recent graduates um, having an informational table at our annual powwow um, involving aquatic invasive species, which is a big issue in our area. And we also have a, a stretch of highway that uh, uh, that we adopt. So I get my students, uh, maybe through a little pressure or whatever, but um, I get them to, uh, to come out and help me um, take care of this stretch of highway. These are important things. And I find that any kind of um, extracurricular, co-curricular activities like research really seems to up the engagement in all of these areas. So that's something that I see as a, a, a major positive outcome to these types of projects. As far as our uh, a brief overview of our community, um, Keweenaw Bay Indian community, uh, the, we are a federally recognized tribe. There's a lot of confusion here um, that often comes up regarding the, the, the name. And I can tell you that um, in a lot of cases, it just comes down to spelling. Ojibwe is the proper uh, pronunciation in the Anishinaabe, um, in the Ojibwe language, uh, the E has a sound like A. So Ojibwe with the E on the end is actually a, a little more of a traditional spelling. Um, in legal terms, um, the word Chippewa, the name Chippewa is often used. Um, but I'm hearing more and more people use, uh, re refer to the word Anishinaabe, um, which has a, a little more of a traditional use to it, um, which loosely translates to the original people. Um, and uh, across Michigan in the Great Lakes area, um, the people of the three fires, is, uh, that's another phrase that often comes up and that includes uh, the Ottawa and Potawatomi tribes too. So a lot of, a lot of relatives in the area. So um, I'm gonna be pulling up some map images as I go through out uh, this presentation, but our reservation, the Lance Indian Reservation, 59,000 acres and like a lot of reservations, it's got a little bit of a um, checkerboard look to it. Um, so not all the parcels within those boundaries are owned by um, the tribe or tribal members. Um, but in the treaties that I'm going to explain uh, next, over 10 million acres um, of territory was ceded to, uh, to the U.S. government. But an important point here is that this is the ancestral homeland um, of the tribe. There, this, there was no relocation that happened, unlike a lot of the tribes from this area that were um, moved, in most cases, west of the Mississippi River, um, but not this tribe. So this has been the home for um, since time immemorial. And there are two really key treaties that form a really important context with, uh, with this, this research, with this whole project. The first was uh, the 1842 treaty with the Chippewa. Um, in this treaty, the, the tribe reserved existing rights or you know, preserved their rights across their ancestral homeland um, and waters. So for hunting, um, fishing, gathering, worship. So this includes over 10 million acres that I mentioned. Um, and just as a little historical timeline, this coincided awfully closely with Michigan's development um, as a, this was, it was in the early years of its statehood. Michigan became a state in 1837. And um, right around this time, um, copper mining was, uh, was really getting developed. That's another historical thing that our area is, is known a lot for in the decades following um, this treaty was um, major, major copper mining. Um, so this treaty was followed up by another one in 1854, which established the reservation. So it affirmed the off reservation treaty rights and established the 59,000 acre reservation. So I'm, I'm going to show a map now that illustrates all of this. 
and I'll try to make some important points as I go. So the dark little sort of L-shaped uh, section right in the center of this image is the Lance Indian Reservation. So that's where the 59,000 acres are. Um, this slightly in between color, gosh, I don't even know how to describe that color. Coral, maybe? Um, that is what's uh, referred to as the home territory for the KBIC. And within this, I superimposed on this map, the Portage Waterway up here. This is the Keweenaw Peninsula, this big peninsula that juts out into Lake Superior. And this was uh, historically the copper mining district for the area. Um, these water bodies that are right in the middle of that peninsula are called the Portage Waterway. And you're gonna see some more maps zoomed in even further. Um, but this is the area where, uh, where our, our study took place and um, everything I'm going to be talking about with the off-reservation fishing and spear fishing, this is where it is in the Portage Waterway. So again, to emphasize the key points from the treaties, the reservation is this smaller area here, but tribal members reserved rights through this treaty to fish and hunt and gather all through this area. And um, something I'll probably touch on later is that um, unfortunately through time and, um, and even still today, those treaty rights seem to be not very well understood by a lot of uh, non-natives in the area. So then this big outer boundary that you see around this whole area and into Wisconsin, um, between this tribe and others throughout the region, that's what's considered the ceded territory. That was what was outlined in that 1842 treaty. And if I were to zoom out, there would be other neighboring um, parts of the region that were uh, similarly addressed through other treaties. So this, these issues are something I've been familiar with as I've worked here and as I've lived here, but I found that um, as I travel the country and go to other, um, other reservations and meet people from other tribes, I find that uh, not everyone is aware of the idea of, uh, of the ceded territories and off-reservation treaty rights. So I just wanna be sure to be, be um, clear about that because it really does play into um, this, this whole fishing issue in our area. And a couple of other key historical events. In 1936, the tribe received its federal recognition. Um, it adopted its constitution and bylaws. But it wasn't until 1971 in an important court case, um, People versus Jandro, where finally the Supreme Court once and for all ruled in favor of the tribe affirming those off-reservation treaty rights from that. Oh, I'm sorry, I see, a, I see a typo on the PowerPoint slide. I should say 1842 treaty. So the treaty rights from the 1842 were, as I kind of alluded to, um, pretty regularly disputed um, in the area. And it wasn't until 1971 that the Supreme Court stepped in in this case and confirmed that the tribe and all the members do have these rights to fish and hunt and everything else off the reservation. So that was a really big deal um, in our area. And some recent developments since then throughout the, uh, the 80s and into the 90s, um, we've had the formation of GLIFWIC, that's an acronym, it stands for the Great Lakes um, Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. So if you're not familiar with GLIFWIC, that's an intertribal um, agency, uh, which does wonderful work. And they really help with a lot of the collaboration between the tribes, um, particularly with a lot of education and outreach, um, over helping to oversee the uh, fisheries uh, stewardship. And they have a lot of wonderful programs. Um, if you're not familiar with GLIFWIC, I would highly recommend um, looking up their website and reading about all the great things they do. Also, the tribe um, in the 1980s began uh, the development of its own natural resource department, which has grown tremendously since then with a lot of different programs. 
Um, but the fisheries has always been one of the one of the major um, programs within the natural resource department. Um, we have our own hatchery. Um, we stock a lot of the area streams and lakes. There's a lot of investment in terms of money and time and human resources. So that's um, a really big deal. And that's kind of one of the, the rationales for our work too, is that um, um, being able to maximize all of these efforts by um, that people put into, especially with our fisheries management. Um, we've also had our, our, our college, uh, which began in the 70s and has grown to what we are now. And it's important to mention we have a casino, which provides a lot of income for the tribe and a lot of jobs. So as to what um, brought us to our interest in this research off the reservation, I would begin by explaining that beginning in 2015, we, we started collecting data on all of our important streams in this area. So I mentioned we have a lot of water and a lot of forests, and these are cold water streams. So they support um, cold water fish species like brook trout. So of course, with the emergence of concerns about climate change and um, or invasive species, um, changing um, maybe weather patterns, uh, changes in the uh, seasonal trends, um, we thought it would be really important for uh, to start collecting data, continuous data on um, the temperature of our area stream. So this started pretty small in 2015 and out of concern for brook trout, which is one of the species that our tribe invests heavily in. Um, so this is kind of the launching pad for uh, our Portage Lake research. And this map image, it's another simplified image, but it shows most of our you know, smaller stream systems on the reservation. And these two circles, this is the, our two um, big areas in the Portage waterway off the reservation. But um, as far as stream monitoring sites uh, to date, now, so we've got five years into this overall. We've got over 60 study sites. We've had a lot of student um, assistance, um, a lot of conference presentations, um, a couple of peer-reviewed publications, and a recommendation report. So this is this has really grown since it uh, since it began a few years ago, which is wonderful. And as far as how this research is conducted. I've got some images on the screen here. Um, the first is uh, a submersible temperature data logger. You can see it below affixed to a brick. That's what we use as weights, so you can get an idea of the size of these. They're, they're quite small, and we program them uh, to collect, uh, to record a water temperature reading every two hours. Um, we submerge them um, in whatever water bodies that, um, that we're studying. Um, we need to make sure they're weighted to the bottom so they stay underwater. Um, and this little graphic on the right shows that after we re retrieve them with the proper um, software and hardware, um, all of that awesome data that those things collect and store can be directly uploaded which is really cool. So I've got a little image here of one of our students working with uh, one of the natural resource department technicians that helps us. And you can see this little pile of data loggers. This is the data uploading process. Um, here's the interface linked right by USB to, um, to a laptop. And what this produces is basically uh, for each logger, a, a spreadsheet. So here's an example from one logger and in this case, um, if you can tell, I'm not sure if the, the uh, font is really small on your end, but um, this is actually uh, four years of data that I just pasted together. Um, but you can see I've got it aligned by um, the date and the time, and you can see that there's a temperature reading every two hours. And these are incredibly precise little um, logging devices. They record to the thousandth of a degree um, Fahrenheit. So just as a quick example, um, this allows us to compare year over year trends from the same location, same date, same time, as, also, as well as uh, looking at the loggers individually and looking at seasonal trends. So here's the, the, the rationale behind this and why we view this as such important work. 
Um, as again, tribal fishing is a really important tradition in our in our uh, in our community, and also an important um, for sustenance. Um, this is historically a fishing community, and fish are um, well. Aside from some occasional pollution issues in our area, um, fish are obviously a healthy source of protein. So there's a lot of, uh, and there's a lot of tradition involved, um, family traditions, community traditions. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, um, with these treaty rights, the tribe being able to manage its own fisheries is really an important um, statement of sovereignty. So with between the hatchery and all of the natural resource department personnel involved in stocking, this is an enormous investment for our tribe. And um, the tribe does uh, oversee this annual um, traditional spear harvest that I'll be focusing on for the rest of my time. Um, but really what it comes down to is in light of the uncertain environmental issues going on these days is the notion that environmental changes, ecological changes could have some really, really um, significant cultural impacts if we're talking about changes in water temperatures that could obviously change the um, makeup of the fish species community, um, changes in the timing of seasonal events, for example. So that's what's really important. And then to kind of link to my generalized community-based research model, the mixed methodology that we used here um, includes a survey to get some insight and to be able to quantify the perspectives and concerns of the community. Um, as I'll mention, we did uh, get some uh, anecdotal interview research, and I say anecdotal for the purposes of this paper, but, uh, but statements from community members, though, that were incorporated into the management plan that, um, that we developed for the tribe. And of course, combining all that with um, on the ground ecological uh, research and coming up with a best recommendation to the, uh, to the decision makers in our community. So that's really our, our rationale. So our expansion into the Portage Waterway, we began this uh, after a couple of years of um, getting our feet wet, literally, with the stream temperature monitoring. But the species of concern here in this body of water isn't brook trout, it's walleye or ogawag. So what we're talking about here is traditional spear fishing for tribal members and leveraging those off-reservation treaty rights that are assured through that 1842 treaty. So again, this is a, a, an important uh, community and family tradition and an important source of, um, of food for tribal members. And it's um, carefully overseen by the tribe's own um, biologists with uh, other relevant agency partners. It, it really is a team effort. But it's uh, without a doubt a scientifically managed um, in stocked fisheries. So they use a total allowable catch um, approach. And for the tribal members, the established quota following those methods is 2,000 fish per year. So that means uh, the, the, the tribal members through the annual um, spearing, which happens in the late spring, can sustainably harvest up to 2,000 fish per year. As you'll see, they've never approached that. So like most fish species, the presence of walleye or ogawag depends on temperature. So spearing, um, hopefully this should make sense, um, needs to happen in shallow water. And that's where the fish come when it's time for spawning. So when it's spawning season, which is late spring, it's actually shortly after the, uh, the last of the, um, the ice melts and um, getting into early summer, that's when the walleye will enter the shallow waters and be able to be harvested um, through spearing. So this typically uh, for them is, requires uh, temperatures in the 40 degree range throughout the 40s as the temperature warms up, as spring moves on and gets above 50 degrees, they leave and head out for deeper, colder, colder waters. So our working hypothesis is that the waterway does not warm uniformly, um, but unfortunately that's how it's been, it's been managed. 
um, with a single start date and end date to the season based on temperature readings in the main waterway. But we have this problem that the quota has never been approached, not even close to that. So our question was, can we management develop a plan maybe to revise the timing of the, of the harvest season that would reflect the diverse temperature trends and maybe result in um, more fish for tribal members. So I'm, I'm gonna, looking at the time here, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit, um, but here's a quick example of uh, the percent of quota harvested um, over a three year period. And you can see that there are a lot more fish that could sustainably be harvested and in 2018, which is the year we're focusing on, only 16% of the sustainable harvest was taken. So what we did to get into this project began with a community survey. And I mentioned to the student, Sophia, this was one of the highlights of her capstone research. So this was a major contribution from Sophia um, to capture the community views, uh, perspectives on the harvest tradition. So this was carried out in um, early 2018 using SurveyMonkey. Um, it contained 27 questions. It was open to an adult enrolled um, tribal members. And as a standalone project, um, the methodology was uh, great for her, her capstone. We view this as kind of an enhancement um, of our temperature research. Um, using the the methodology, I, I you know I'm fine with acknowledging that it's uh, not necessarily the most um, scholarly methodology in the world, but again, just trying to capture some some thoughts and perspectives of community members, um, that was our goal. So we found some um, some really important um, some really important views coming out of this. Um, for one here, this is a table that I, I just pasted right from our paper, the reasons for uh, spearfishing. And we gave uh, the community, the respondents, a list of choices and they could select as many as they wanted. And you can see a pretty wide variety of reasons. So in other words, why, um, what are their reasons for fishing? And you can see all the things I've touched on, exercising treaty rights, uh, food source, uh, tradition, quality time with the family, and here's some other key takeaways. 92% of the respondents um, agreed that the spearfishing is important to them personally. Um, and even more, 98% said that it's important for the tribe, the community in general. 82% um, said they would be interested in a mentorship program, uh, like a workshop if one was offered. But all respondents, um, which was, I believe we had 54 respondents, agreed that it, uh, it's important for the tribe to manage this fishery themselves. Again, so I think that really speaks to the importance of sovereignty. As far as concerns, um, there were definitely a lot of concerns that were noted. Again, climate change being one. Um, which uh, and we had a separate question listed with similar um, with similar results about just seasonal changes, temperature changes, um, changes in the uh, maybe in the clarity of the water. Aquatic invasive species were noted as a big concern, lakeshore urban development. And here's one that's really unfortunate. Discrimination from non from the non-native community. 84% of our our um, respondents said that they they see that as uh, they feel that that's uh, something that could affect their harvest. So there were a lot of examples given um, and we noted a lot in uh, again in the sort of anecdotal interviews that were conducted on site throughout the harvest period because those things are shared with the the tribal leadership uh, like instances of um, of harassment for example that's that's a big one or people uh, maybe throwing throwing rocks at the the tribal fishers. It's really unfortunate, um, but it it's it does happen. Um, I would be cautious about how much I speak for for the the tribal community, but my impression is that this happens more as you get further away from the reservation, and maybe you're talking about people who are uh, less informed about treaty rights. But one way or the other, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate and it's a, it's a problem. As far as 
our temperature data, this is a little bit of a crude map here, but this shows uh, the Portage Waterway and each of those black dots, there's 13 of them. Those are the locations where we, uh, where we had temperature loggers. We grouped them into uh, two categories um, for the purpose of analysis. Our, our real rationale here, our big area of concern was Pike Bay and Dollar Bay. Sorry, but I'll scroll back to the map. Dollar Bay is this little inlet right here. Pike Bay is this one. Those, those are really popular um, sites for spearfishing. It's shallow water, they're accessible. Um, so our big uh, point of analysis was to compare the temperature trends in those two inlets versus the main portage and torch lake system. And one reason, and the other reason that we uh, wanted to do that comparison is that the, the Portage and Torch Lake water temps, uh, the readings like daily readings as the season goes on, those are the temperatures that are used to determine the start and close of the harvest season. But again, keep in mind that these, uh, the uh, Ogawag, the walleye are very sensitive to the temperature changes. And we're talking about springtime when the temperatures are going to be on a warming trend. So to jump to uh, our key finding from all of this with temperature trends, this graphic, this chart is really what, what says it all. So I know there's a lot of information here, but I'll, I'll leave it on the screen for a couple minutes. Um, this blue dashed line shows uh, the optimal spawning temperature of walleye at 42 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see on this axis, that coincides with the opening date. This is when the, the spear harvest season was declared open by tribal uh, management. Um, so in other words, the temperature in the main body of water was found to reach 42 degrees. And they said, okay, we're starting the harvest season. You know, go, go spearing and good luck. And you can see that it was closed when the temperature pretty much got to 50 degrees. However, the yellow and the red lines show the Dollar Bay and Pike Bay, again, the two smaller inlets that are really popular for spear fishing. And what's a little concerning here is that these two little inlets had already warmed up enough and exceeded the optimal spawning temperature before the harvest season was even opened. So we think this is a big explanation as to why the quota is, has never even been approached and why um, the, the fishery is not being maximized. It's being underutilized um, because of the differences in the water temperatures across different parts of this vast, diverse um, body of water. So, and just a, a quick glimpse of how this looks in a table. Just for a real simple analysis, uh, a, a t-test comparing mean differences in temperatures between the two sets of loggers in these different bays and the portage main temperatures. So this is looking at a day-by-day -day mean temperature um, across these two groups. And just looking at the numbers in bold, you can see that the, the bay, the loggers in these smaller bays um, even without running the, the statistical analysis, you can see how much higher those temperature readings are than in this column, the main portage bay. So I know I need to wrap this up in the next few minutes, so I'll, I'll try to get to my um, last couple slides of key findings, if everyone's still, uh, still with me. So as we suspected, the water in the shallower bays and inlets um, certainly do warm, or at least in 2018, they did warm um, significantly earlier than the main portage and torch lake areas, which means when the fishing season was declared open for spear harvesting, the fish had probably already come and gone. Um, and that's a problem. If, if the tribe wants to be able to maximize its, ma maximize its harvest, it's going to need to look at a different um, management approach. That, that's our, our statement coming away from all this. So what we proposed and that we have a, a, contained in our 
management plan is for the tribal leadership. And this comes down this, and when I say tribal leadership, now I'm talking about the tribal president and the council. They are the ones who call the shots on the opening and closing of the season. Um, what we're recommending is that this whole vast water uh, body be, be opened and closed in stages. So starting with these red zones on this image, this is Pike Bay and Dollar Bay again. Um, well, based on our data, we're finding that these sites should be opened the soonest um, because they're shallower, they're going to warm up quicker, they probably receive uh, more uh, warmer runoff from the streams that feed them. So these would be what we would call a uh, red zone or zone one to open these areas first, followed by the, uh, the orange zones, which again are um, kind of the connecting bodies to this whole portage waterway. Those would, uh, we found were the next areas to warm up, followed by the blue, which is up here. This is called Torch Lake. And then finally, by the whole port, what we call the portage main, this whole main body. I realize it's kind of a really funny shaped water system, but the portage main refers to this whole main body in the middle, which as the biggest and the deepest, it makes sense that this would take longer to, to warm up. So that is the key takeaway as far as our management for or our, our recommendation for management and here's just some follow-up numbers. So for this study period, 2018, 330 Ogawag, or 331, I'm sorry, were, were harvested out of a sustainable quota of 2,000. So again, the fishery um, is being underutilized. Um, and since this is such a deeply valued um, tradition, we hope that the tribal leadership will, um, will consider our recommendations and we are going to we do have more data to to dissect that that wasn't even brought into this um this paper if you read our paper um so the work is ongoing um but it's important also that um the concerns that that we documented by the survey respondents and by the interviewees we want to be sure that the um, leadership is aware of those so looking ahead we were interrupted this year by this darn um, COVID-19. Uh, we, um, we weren't allowed. Um, we didn't have permission to get out and, um, in, and uh, do our data collection. In fact, it was a, a disappointment that the whole um, harvest was, was called off um, out of concern for tribal members' health. So we're all going to have a one-year gap, but otherwise we are going to continue and expand this as we um, try to detect any potential long-term trends. Um, and we're going to continue linking this to the vast collection of fish population data that the or tribal fisheries biologists collect. Um, as I mentioned, our, our preliminary um, management plan is ready to submit. And we wanna make sure that students can continue getting these valuable experiences and contributing um, for our, our tribal member students, um, they, they really see the value in doing important work that contributes to their community and their families. I mean, these are real world issues. So again, the value of the community-based research and these student experiences really jumps out. And, um, and again, getting students to get these other scholarly activities or experiences that are atypical for two-year programs, getting them to conferences, um, getting them to present posters and um, being acknowledged as co-authors, they definitely see the value in that as I do. So I will end it here. Um, I wanna be sure to acknowledge most importantly that this research occurred on the ancestral homelands of um, Keweenaw Bay Indian community. And there are a lot of people to thank, um, a lot of partners at the tribe, at the natural resources department, um, at the college, um, a lot of community members shared their knowledge and insight, um, which um, we couldn't have done this without that. Um, we've had other students who contributed over the years um, who have uh, graduated and moved on. 
And again, I want to thank Carletta and everyone involved in this, um, this special issue of Water in the Native World. What a wonderful thing that such great research from um, so many Native nations is, is getting out there and bringing these voices to, um, to the table. This is so good and I hope it continues. I also want to be sure to acknowledge that this was funded through a uh, USDA grant through the Tribal College Research um, Grants Program. So I believe I am at the end of my time. I know we want to save some time for questions. So um, thank you all very much. And I guess I'll send it back to, uh, to Carletta or open it up to anyone who might have any questions that I could answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kojic. Yes, um, and at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. And we do like um, people to have the feel of that conversation, even though we're all remotely located. So I'll go ahead and see if Anna Putman can ask her question. Hey, yeah, just needed to unmute. Um, so I was curious about, um, thank you for the talk, by the way. Uh, I made me quite nostalgic for um, going to school at Michigan Tech. <laughs> So oh, you, you too. Map, I was, I was like, oh yeah, that that spot, that spot. But um, that's a total aside. I was just curious about um, if there were any relationships between the health of the fishery and um, the presence of like metals in the water. I know there's a lot of mine tailings that are you know on the coasts there and um, yeah, on Portage Lake, on Torch Lake everywhere in between. And I know, um, I remember that that was a factor in the suppression of some of the benthic macroinvertebrates, which I would imagine would relate to the health of the fishery. And I was just curious if that was a component of, um, you know, any of, any of this work or any of the, you know, just future sustainability for the fishery. Well, thank you, Annie. That's a incredibly, um, relevant question. And the short answer is that um, there's a lot of um, parallel research going on that um, with all, well, you mentioned Michigan Tech, and that's where I went to. And we have um, a lot of partners at Michigan Tech. They're, a, a, for us, a pretty big institution. So they're a really valuable partner. But yeah, there are, as, um, as you sound like you're aware, a lot of concerns about legacy uh, mining uh, pollutants in that entire waterway, especially in Torch Lake. Um, and there are concerns about um, an important um, area called Buffalo Reef, which is um, east of the Keweenaw Peninsula in Lake Superior. That's uh, considered one of the most important spawning grounds for, um, for lake trout. Um, so there is, so again, uh, in a nutshell, there's a lot of research um, related to that um, that wasn't directly a part of what, um, of our little project here, but the same, uh, many of the same groups of researchers are collaborating across multiple um, projects, multiple, um, you know, uh, grants that, the, that they're uh, funded through. Um, uh, so there's really, there really is a three-way partnership um, well, more than that, but with the three key partners at IC, which is us at the Tribal College, um, Michigan Tech, and our Tribal Natural Resource Department. consumption. Um, there was a major survey done that uh, our natural resource department led getting information on a tribal members fish consumption and we've done some sampling here of the different fish species where we've assessed the mercury um, content in the fish to basically try to assess exposure levels and health risks. So in other words, um, 
there's a lot going on. Um, I guess I could kind of say you you just opened a really big can, <laughs> and and I, I probably don't have time to elaborate any more than that. But yeah, those are great examples of really other really important work that are definitely relevant. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess I could add one thing too, regard back to the idea of the the health concerns. I mean, health is a always a big issue, and and um, you know, obviously relating to staple food sources. Um, some of the work that we've started doing out of concern of mercury, it's 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 uh, uh, neat to to note that we've partnered with other larger tribal colleges on that research too. So I'll. I guess I could mention um, one of my partners in that area is Dr. Um, Doug Stevens, who's uh, kind of semi-retired now, but he worked at Salish Kootenai College for a long time. So, so the point being that a lot of um, partnerships have developed across tribal colleges um, as far as um, larger ones who have resources that, that we kind of lack because we're small. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to visit a tribal college or to mentor tribal college students or to collaborate with a tribal college professor, I highly encourage that. I had an opportunity to visit uh, Kenawa Bay Indian Community and the Portage Waterway and to also guest lecture in Andrew's class in October. Um, it was just a wonderful experience and I had an excellent um, uh, time there and just learning about the environmental issues and learning about the culture. So um, yeah, so please reach out to your local tribal college. Yeah, there are, um, you know, it's the more, the more I do that, I mean, I, again, I don't want to speak for others um, and certainly at other um, institutions, but the more I do that, the more I network and collaborate with people at other tribal colleges, the more I find that um, we, we do have a lot of common ground um, and, and certainly a lot of common interests, uh, common challenges, and great things can happen when we work together. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining. We have a poll that we would like you to um, complete just to give us uh, feedback on our webinar series. Um, so I encourage you to uh, join our next webinar, which will be next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And it'll be on Change Rippling Through Our Waters and Culture by Kristen Martin um, and others. And um, it focuses on tribes in Montana. So please visit the um, website to register and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.